So first, thanks to uh, FIT, ISU, and the TEDx organizers for having me. Um, I have some slides to go with this thing, but I'll tell you about the beginning. You have the, uh, the title in your programs. Um, some time ago, uh, we had this idea when the iPhone 4 came out to exploit its capability and fly it to space. And it was just an idea. And I used to say when we started it that I either have a vision or a hallucination, and we're going to find out which. <laughs> so uh, it started, so I'm, I'm from Canada. It started when I was a kid. My parents uh, put me down in front of the TV uh, to watch people land on the moon. And I was uh, pretty little, but it's a memory that stuck with me, and it ignited the, the passion that I have for, uh, for space. So this is the end. Can, I, can you guys put it back to the beginning, please? <laughs> so, you know, I, uh, growing up in Canada, so let me, let me, uh, you know. I'm uh, at the foot of the ladder. It really was something that ignited a passion for me. And I think for many people, there's an event that they can trace back to that ignites that passion and makes them committed to pursue a path with all its twists and turns to get to a result. And this really was the turning, turning point for me, even though it was a long time ago. So fast forward. Uh, fast forward. Fast forward 20 years, and so I'm a kid from Canada, um, and in January of 1989, Canada and the United States signed a free trade agreement, which was the beginning of a lot of kind of different geopolitical things, but certainly extended the relationship Canada-US had. And I had a chance, after I also finished school right at the same time in December of 1988, I had a chance to go work uh, in human spaceflight at NASA's Johnson Space Center. And if you've been to Johnson Space Center lately, you know that the Saturn V is in a nice, pretty building now, and it's well-preserved. But this is what it looked like back in, in 1989 when I started there. And when I drove into work every day, this was another source of inspiration. You know, as many of you know, and if you've been to the Space Center here, this is not a mock-up. This was, you know, Apollo ended at 17. There was 18, 19, 20 in the works, and this is one of those rockets. So fast forward another 14 years, and after working uh, in human spaceflight and, and really committed to it, uh, I had a chance to, to start a company. And starting a company is another thing that, that is driven by passion and commitment and uh, uh, a desire to get things done. And what we do at that company is spacecraft guidance, navigation, and control. And certainly most of this audience is probably familiar with that terminology. But for those of you that are not, uh, guidance is, of course, where you want to go. Where is the spacecraft planning to go? Navigation is the science of figuring out where you are at that particular moment in time. And control is what you do to go from where you want to be, sorry, from where you are to where you want to be. And that's what we do. And in that work, we, find, we found ourselves in this era of purpose-built devices. Uh, space agencies and space programs, they design very specific uh, hardware and software to accomplish tasks um, that are complicated, uh, but it turns out that it's very expensive to develop, very expensive to support, and they have limited applications. So they realized that and they started to shift to this commercial um, uh, model where they, they get to use things that have already been developed or that are motivated by the commercial environment. And so my company, we've been very lucky. Uh, we've worked with, uh, with SpaceX. We had a lot of work to do on their Dragon spacecraft, which was successful recently. Uh, we've worked with Orbital, who, if all goes well, will fly by the end of the year, another commercial project. But these things are very big. Uh, commercial orbital transportation services, commercial cargo and resupply, and then the commercial crew, which is the next thing, getting these commercial companies. And I was thinking, if, if the very big works, then why not the very small? And in particular, the iPhone. And iPhone 4, when it came out, it was the first device to comprehensively include an accelerometer, 
a gyro, certainly the high resolution camera, the ability to manipulate and process an image. Now that exists in, in other places now, but this was in a tiny package. And in the business of guidance, navigation and control, uh, we call this kind of an avionics box. It had all the necessary ingredients to do the kinds of things that we do. But what should we do with it? Because we're a space company, not an app company. And apps, as you know, of course, are the software that drive most of the smaller devices, the mobile devices. So we made a checklist of objectives. The first, of course, was to certify and characterize the device for use in space, which is non-trivial. There's a lot of different constraints that go with bringing an object into space. Of course, I wanted to demonstrate its performance, to do, its ability to do serious tasks. You know, you can bring up a device to play songs and videos and possibly games, but we wanted to show that the devices have much broader application. And we wanted to exploit the intrinsic features of the platform. There are activities out there where people have peeled apart these things and used the hardware to do fantastic things, including some things in space. But we wanted to do something that was intrinsically inherent with the platform. And of course, do it with a very specific purpose in the environment of space, so something you couldn't do on the ground. And then the other thing, clearly with the reach, these products even, so you know, I, I'm a fan of Apple products and I learned when was working with them, there are over 200 million devices in the world, which means there's a possibility certainly for outreach, 200 million devices that run the iOS. And then of course, people ask me all the time, the little asterisk that showed up, there are no phone calls to be made from space because the roaming charges are astronomical. <laughs> so, we, were, we had a project, so you know, if you're familiar with Apple, it's an unfortunate acronym, but we started with a lost in space app. And uh, the working concept was to use the images and overlays and the detailed hardware capability to recover a, a, a spacecraft navigated state in orbit. And the question was, will it be accurate enough to provide maneuvers? And will it be useful enough in the event of an emergency, for example? Now, this was all hypothetical. There was no intent to use it. So there's actually, interestingly, in the agreement, when you make software for the iPhone, you have to say it will not be used in a life-saving event. So we couldn't do it even if we wanted to. So it was inspired by work we did um, for the crew return vehicle project, where we did have to process imagery to recover the state. And I'll talk more about the app later. But now what? So we have to certify it. Will it actually be safe? Will it work? So you do a lot of things you don't normally do to a phone. We put it on shake tables so it would survive launch. We put it in a vacuum to see if it would explode or peel apart. We put it in high temperature environments. We expose it to radiation and electromagnetic interference and, in, and microgravity. And we actually flew it on the zero G plane because we asked the technical guys at Apple, will this work? in zero G, and they're like, we don't know. Because it has accelerometers, and if you have one of these devices, they depend a lot on the orientation. So we actually flew it, there's no sound on purpose, because if you know the nickname of the, the, the flights, the Vomit Comet, we didn't want that audio. And of course, all of this almost certainly voids the warranty. So then we wanted to go to space, and what are the options? There weren't that many at the time, and we wanted to go to the space station, of course. It's a great environment for doing experiments. Um, and what very few people know is that part of the space station is designated a U.S. national laboratory. So you know, and, and they publish these things on the, on the national laboratory websites. You know about Brookhaven, you know about Lawrence Livermore, you know about Sandia Laboratory, but you don't know about the Space Station National Laboratory. And I say it's because it's not on the map. So I offered to put it on the map. Now, you gotta get there somehow, and it turns out, and you'll hear more about this later, it turns out there's a company who specializes in flying small payloads to space, and in particular to the Space Station. It's a commercial entity. And in keeping with the iPhone, which is small and four ounces, they offer tiny packages to be transported. And I like to say small is the new big. You can really accomplish a lot in a small package. And historically, and I'm stealing this from Jeff Manber from Nanorax, historically things have gone from big to small. A long time ago, big cars were all the rage, the biggest possible car with big engines. And now we have drifted into small cars. And 
Electronics and computers used to be very, very big, and now they're very small. So small is the new big, and it's a perfect fit for the kind of things we want to do. And it provides a standardized option for getting there. So we engage with them as a partner, and certainly with NASA, to try to get these things to fly. So All three engines up we ended up flying on the last two, shuttle flight, one, which was very zero, exciting. And, and uh, of course, we had to get up to the space station and then find time for them to use it. And what I love about this video is that we were at the launch, and before it flew, we set up one of these gripping tripods to a post, and this is actually an iPhone video. And we set it up before we launched, and we, did, you know, certainly aiming at the launch platform. But if you watch carefully, the shuttle literally enters the clouds and disappears from view for the remainder of the, the ground-based observation, right up in the top corner, as if we knew ahead of time exactly what was going to happen. So I had to include that. So we built an app. Space Lab for iOS. Uh, certainly the first incarnation and, and, and hopefully not the last. So I'll let you watch this video. This was actually fun to make. Um, it's, it's, it's graphics, of course, but it, it shows really how big the space station is. And then, of course, we do the fly through. And this is the cupola. If you know the space station, there is an observation sort of dome that looks down on Earth. And the cupola is actually where we, we, we ended up doing our, our observations. So, we ended up with four experiments on the phone. And we set it up kind of in the same premise where you, you touch each one and the experiments show up. There are some links also for, for some, some other information. We did a limb tracker. A limb tracker is a navigation function. If you look from space at the horizon of Earth, you can match the horizon and get an estimate of orientation and even altitude from the curvature. We did a sensor calibration exercise with a QR barcode, where the QR barcode is positioned on space station at a known location, and then we take a bunch of imagery to calibrate the sensors. The ride up is somewhat uh, aggressive, and we didn't know what it would do to the devices, so we wanted to recalibrate once we got on orbit. There's a state acquisition function, which we got all of the coastline database from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and populated it as a wireframe that you could manipulate and match to the uh, coastlines from an observation on the space station. And then we had a life cycle flight instrumentation, which was really a radiation tracking experiment. We wanted to see how a commercial device would do in space. And simplicity was the key, and we had to make it clear. This isn't a game, there's no challenge. Certainly if you're trying to recover your state, you don't want it to be too challenging in an emergency situation. You want to try to gear it for success. But the other thing that this invited us to do was to put everything into one package. And so all of the procedures are on the phone. And if you're familiar with typical um, paperwork associated with procedures, there's stacks and stacks that have to be re read and approved. And I remember when we were approaching flight, of course, like every project, it was tight deadlines and, and, and difficult to meet, working very hard. And we were getting um, requests, constant requests for the procedures. And we had an opportunity to make a presentation um, uh, before that in, in San Francisco with Apple. And there was some media that covered it. And the they advertised that the, that the procedures were available and online, and so they, they just went and got them online. So when we go back to the checklist, we did accomplish certification of the platform. We did demonstrate its potential for performing serious tasks. We, we did come up with a, an app that exploits the features of the device, and we did do it ex capitalizing on the unique environment of space. And the last one was how do we sort of promote space education. So what we did is we released a ground version of the application. In fact, it's identical software. There's a test in the software that says, is there gravity or no gravity? And once there's no gravity, essentially it's a simulated environment. And there wasn't time to do it today, but we have done demonstrations with a uh, inflatable earth beach ball 
that's about two meters across, and you can take pictures and align the coastlines and align the horizon and get a good relative estimate. It says you're, you know, 50,000 miles above the Earth, but it's basically showing you that the device works in principle. And you can even do it with a photograph. It, it doesn't depend in large part on what you're using. Of course, the accuracy will suffer, but at least the point was to show people the kinds of things that are going on in space. So the final checklist. We did, in fact, promote space education and awareness, and we were very happy to have that done. So then, after being in space for a long, long time, there were challenges on the space station. There was a, a, um, a, a failure of one of the launches of the Russian spacecraft. It, it occupied a lot of the crew time, so we didn't get on the, on the manifest to be executed until later. So much, much later, we got executed, we got the data, and then it was returned on the Soyuz TMA-22 just just uh, a, a little while ago, and it took these fantastic images, which uh, from the cupola on, on the small device, which is quite impressive. And we're very excited to have the data. We're in the process of analyzing, and we think this is just the beginning. We think there's a real place for these small devices that cost on the order of $500 or $1,000 to become uh, enablers and facilitators for performing experiments or productivity tools for the astronauts in space. And we're looking for opportunities. And in fact, we're engaged in, in exploring the next set of opportunities on a subsequent flight. But the first thing we have to do, of course, is finish the analysis of what we've got. But in this kind of community, there, I'm sure there are a lot of people with very good ideas. And I am looking forward to working with as many of you as possible. Thank you very much.